this morning I'm going to begin a, a brand new series. We're starting a brand new series today, and this series is titled Taking God at His Word. Taking God at His Word. God's promises for your every need. And we're going to go through this series at least six weeks. We might even go a little bit longer. But we're going to be talking about uh, our God who keeps His promises. In fact, that's today's message titled, God Keeps His Promises. Uh, God is someone that we can take at His Word. How many of you know that you can't take everybody at their word? You can't take everybody at their word. But we know we can take God at His Word. When He says, I promise that means something. You know, that used to mean something for us as well. I promise is a phrase that used to mean something. If somebody said to you, I promise, then as the saying goes, you could take it to the bank because their word was good. You could count on whatever they said if they gave you their word, if they gave you their promise. I think we all know what a promise is, but uh, let's look at a dictionary definition of promise here. Uh, a dictionary definition, a promise is a declaration that something will or will not be done, or will or will not, will not be given. A, a secondary definition is an express assurance on which expectation is to be based. An express assurance on which expectation is to be based. That's a promise, but today... Uh, in, in this world that we're living in, this culture that we live and work in, a promise has become uh, like a tool or a device used to get someone to agree with your plan, someone to vote for you, someone to join your uh, group, or uh, something to help uh, convince somebody else to believe a deception. They might say, I promise. And they're not really uh, planning on keeping their word. Promises are made. Sadly, promises are made and promises are broken with alarming regularity. Some politicians make empty promises. You knew I was going to go there, right? Some politicians make empty promises that nobody believes. I mean, they're, they'll say things that really nobody believes. Not the people on the opposite side, not the people on, even on their own side. That's a crazy thing. You vote for someone based on a promise that you didn't even believe it when they said it. But, I mean, you want to believe it and you're like, well, maybe, maybe they'll keep at least part of it. That's reality. Wedding vows. Wedding vows are promises. They're made before God. And they're made before witnesses. Made while... Well, you get all dressed up in front of family and friends and, and more importantly, God. And at your wedding, the pastor uh, probably asked you something like this. Do you promise to love her, comfort her, honor and keep her, forsaking all others to keep yourself only unto her as long as you both shall live? Or in the old phrase, it, it was until death do you part? To which those of us that are married, we all said, I do. I promise, you know, we're saying, I promise. And then we would double down. You know, I, I, when I uh, counsel couples, uh, do with premarital counseling, and of course, we talk about the ceremony, and I tell them, you're going to have three chances to, make, to say your vows. One is the one where I'll, I'll ask the questions you say I do. The other one is the one where you repeat after me. And then the third one is the rings, because we're doubling down. You know, after you say I do, then... Then you have another vow that says, I so-and-so take you so-and-so to be my wedded wife or my wedded husband. From this day forward, for better or for worse, we like better, right? For richer or for poor, yeah, we like richer. In sickness and in health, to love, honor, cherish, as long as we both shall live. And we, you know, we make that promise. We double down on that promise. And then we triple down on it with a ring ceremony. Uh, but... Way too often, way too often, those promises are broken. They're broken. I don't know if this is even a thing now. Y'all might help me out here. But years ago, uh, guys would give their girlfriends a promise ring. Remember that? The guy, the guy would give his girlfriend a promise ring. And that promise ring meant, someday I'm going to give you a real ring. Someday I promise to give you a more expensive ring to take the place of this promise ring. But I found out yesterday that if you go on eBay or any other shopping site, you can buy 
used promise rings. Isn't that weird? <laughs> used promise rings. In fact, I Googled yesterday afternoon, I Googled used promise rings for sale, and uh, I got 60 million results. I didn't, I didn't look at all of them. I'm not, I don't know if they were all really used uh, or, you know, somebody's just trying to uh, advertise that way to get a sale. But still, 60 million results, that's a lot of broken promises. But it's not just marriage vows. It's not just promise rings. Think of all the, the broken promises that we've come to expect. We read about them. We hear about them. We're like, oh, okay, I mean, that's just life. For example, a coach will sign a contract with a university, a football coach will, or a basketball coach, whatever it might be, signs a contract with a university only to leave early to sign with another university that's offered him a better contract. Right? But the other side is, is, uh, is guilty as well. You know, university gives a coach a five-year contract and then fires him after two years. But, you know, in a sign of the time, sadly, there's always a buyout in the contract. Did you notice that? There's always a buyout. In other words, neither side really expects to keep their promise. That's why they put the buyout in there. The coach has to pay if he breaks his promise, or maybe the school he's going to has to pay the school he's leaving if he breaks his promise and leaves early. The university has to pay if they break their contract and fire the coach. There's, there are schools that are paying two coaches at the same time, the coach they fired and the one that they're going to fire, I mean, the one that they hired. And within our friends and, and, and family and business associates, We've come to expect that, too. I mean, if you lend somebody some money, you expect they're going to pay you back. And when they don't, then it kind of creates some tension in that relationship. I mean, you see them, and you know they owe you money. And then you see that they bought a car, and you're like, OK, uh, why couldn't you use some of that money to pay me back before you bought the car? So all of a sudden, you're, you know, that, that relationship is, is not very strong, and you're starting to get a little angry, a little bitter. And they go on vacation, you're like, why don't you just pay me back instead of taking a vacation? And so, and the other side, instead of paying somebody back, you're always thinking, well, if I have some extra money, I'll pay him back. Or, yeah, I don't think they really need it right now. People buy stuff they can't afford on credit. When you buy something on credit, you're, you're making a promise that you're going to pay that company, that credit card company. Broken promises also... Uh, go the other way. Uh, how, how many of you have a pension at work? You know, you, you're promised benefits, and those benefits maybe were cut. Uh, my wife has an uncle, Uncle Dan, uh, who lost all his savings, all his pension with the Enron scandal in Houston several years ago. Some of you might remember that. He lost everything. He had been working with them for years and years, and he had to start from scratch. Many of my pastor friends and just pastors that I've gotten to know in various uh, settings and groups, even, even Facebook groups, there's Facebook groups of pastors and so on, and, and many of them tell broken promise stories. They, they, I've, heard, I've heard this often. Really, before I was a pastor, I grew up as a PK. My dad was a pastor, so would hear things like, Pastor, you can trust me. I'll always have your back. I believe in you. I believe in this church. And a few weeks later, that same person gets mad and, and leaves a church. I mean, we, we live in an age of mistrust. You've learned from experience that people, companies, the government will break their promises. And so we've learned to doubt, haven't we? We've learned to, to doubt no matter how tight the contract or no matter how deep the relationship that we have or how sincere the commitment, you begin to wonder if a promise kept will always mean, or a promise made rather, will always mean a promise kept. Will a promise made always mean a promise kept? And it's just sad when people bring that same level of distrust that we're so used to living with, bring it into the church. Not just in the relationship with the church, but in the relationship with God. That same distrust. They don't trust the pastor. They don't trust the church. And... They don't trust God. They say God doesn't keep his word. I can't even trust God. He'll let me down just like everybody else. 
Now, I've discovered that people who, who say that God has let them down, and there are people out there. You might have heard somebody say, no, God, I, you know, where is God? I trusted him. He let me down. What kind of God is that? Well, I've learned that people who make that statement and believe that do so based on two mistakes. One is, it's possible that God never made that particular promise to them that they're blaming God of not keeping. Maybe, maybe they think God made that promise, but God didn't make that promise to them. Instead, it's something they feel entitled to. Maybe it's a promise they decided on their own that God should make and keep, but God didn't make that promise. For example, God never promised that we would all get to live 85 years of life. That's not a promise. People get mad because God took a you know, loved one's life too early, according to them. God never promised that we would always be happy. And if we're not happy, then it's God's fault. He's not keeping his promise. No. In fact, Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. And, but that's one mistake that people make who say this. Another mistake is that maybe God did make a particular promise to them that he hasn't kept. But that promise also includes a command that they're ignoring. See, there are two types of promises. There are conditional promises and unconditional promises from God. The unconditional promises are the things that no matter what we believe, it, th these things are going to come to pass. God is sovereign and he, he determined that he would send his son when the time, you know, the fullness of time was up. Uh, God has promised that Jesus is coming back. Whether we believe that or not, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. But then there are conditional promises, many conditional promises that are in response to our obedience. That's when they come true. Think of it this way. If, if, I were to, if I were to say to you here today, if you come to every Sunday service every weekend for the next year, every Sunday service every weekend for the next year, I'm going to buy each of you uh, a steak dinner, the, the best steak dinner in town. Wherever you, wherever you decide that is, I'll take you there and I'll buy that. So then... You start coming, but then you stop coming and you miss 12 weekends. But you still expect me to buy you the steak. That's not a broken promise. If I say, nope, sorry, I'm not, not going to buy, I'm not even going to buy, I'm not even going to buy you a burger. Yeah, you, well, you, you gave your word, pastor. That's a broken promise. No, because it, it was dependent on an act of obedience. So God promises to bless and provide for you. Yes, he does. But if you ignore his commands regarding the way you use money, then you're choosing not to live according to the promise that God made for you. When you choose to engage in sexual sin, you move, out of a, uh, you move your relationship out from under God's umbrella of protection. And so you move that uh, relationship out from God's promise. For your fulfillment and, and happiness and joy. You want God to give you the desires of your heart. But you, don't, you haven't learned to delight yourself in him first. You want everything to go well for you. But what did Paul say to the Ephesians? You don't honor your father and your mother. He said honor your father and your mother that everything may go well for you. Well we want the second part. We just don't want to honor our parents. Even as adults. And then after making all these mistakes, then we say, God's not true to his word. I can't take him at his word. Uh, he doesn't keep his word. Well, the problem is you claimed the promise, but you ignored the command. And folks, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. When I was a little boy, my uh, mom had a little box on the dining room table that looked something like this. Let's show this picture, JJ. This is a promise box <clears throat> that my mom had at the table. How many of you had something similar to this at home? Anybody besides me? Okay, some of you did. Yeah, several of you. Um, ours was in Spanish, so it didn't say our daily bread, but it was the same thing, and I, and I don't think it was plastic. I think it was wood. It's a long time ago, folks, <laughs> long time ago, but I do remember that it was filled with God's promises from his word. 
It was filled with God's promises from the Bible. And I think that's so special because God's promises make a difference in our lives. They make a difference in how we live our lives. But first we must understand them and then we must learn how to apply them correctly to our lives. And that's really what this series is going to be about. I'm giving you an introduction today and then next week we're going to start looking at individual promises from God's word. And so, as I said, skepticism is, is very high in our world. But there are still people that you can trust and believe in. How many of you know that's true? In spite of the, the distrust with which we live, there are still people in our world that we can trust. People you know are going to keep their word, their, uh, their promise to you. You believe someone's promise, if, if they've kept a promise in the past before, then there's a track record. It's a good track record. You're like, okay, I can trust him. I can trust her. You develop trust in the word because they're consistent. What they say is true. You don't doubt it. You don't investigate it. You don't worry or wonder. Um, they're trustworthy. There's a saying, it's kind of a cynical saying, in, in the world, and you've heard it out in the world today, that says, if your mom tells you she loves you, check it out. Verify it. You, know, you don't believe anything. But I'm talking about people who, if they say they love you, you know they love you because they are trustworthy. I have people like that in my life that I completely trust and depend on without doubt, without hesitation. They're dependable, they're reliable, they're faithful, they tr they're true. They keep their promise even when it comes at a cost. They're faithful. Let me tell you folks that that's what God is like, and even more so. God is a promise keeper. God is a promise keeper. He keeps His word all the time. That's His nature. God cannot lie. So the writer to the Hebrew says, God cannot lie. And His promises are designed to fulfill not your every wish. Like, you know, God's promises aren't like a lottery ticket. No, they're not designed to, yo, man, I hit the jackpot. I can get whatever I want. No, they're not designed to fulfill your every wish and desire. They're de designed to fulfill His plan for you, His purpose in your life. Some of you are sitting there wondering, Pastor, when are we going to get to Scripture? Well, here we go. I told you I was just going to give, I'm giving you an introduction. But Hebrews 10.23, by the way, if you want to follow along on the YouVersion Bible app, the notes should be up there and in one place, or you can look them up yourself. But Hebrews 10.23 reads like this, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. He who promised is faithful. And then a few later uh, verses later, that promise is expanded on. In Hebrews 10, 35 and 36, we read this. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, look at this, you will receive what he promised. You will receive what he promised. So first, the writer to the Hebrew says, he who promised is faithful. Then he says, you will receive what he has promised. Because here's the truth. And I want you to, to, I want you to learn this. Very important point. God keeps his promises. And our response should be, amen. Amen. God keeps His promises, and our response should be, Amen. And let me show you why I say that. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 1.20. 2 Corinthians 1.20. And I'm reading from the NIV this morning. We read this, For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through Him, notice this, through Him, the Amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Isn't that great? I love that. Look, just for a little clarity, I want to read it from the New Living Translation, just so we get a, another, another translation of this verse. This is 
First Corinthians, I'm sorry, Second Corinthians 1.20 from the New Living Translation. For all of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes. And through Christ, our amen, which means yes, ascends to God for his glory. Amen. Amen. The word amen is an interesting word. A few years ago, maybe four years, four or five years ago, uh, we went through a series titled Amen. Things we know for sure. And the reason I titled that series Amen is because it's, it's such a powerful word. In fact, I explained to you that time that Jesus is the only one that we read about in Scripture that used the word amen at the beginning of a statement. We say it at the end of a statement or a prayer. He would say it at the beginning. In the King James Version, it's translated, Verily, verily, I say unto you. Some newer translations will say, Truly, I say unto you. That word is actually, Amen. Amen. And uh, I was watching, uh, when right as we were about to begin that series, uh, it was a, a series right after Easter, if I'm not mistaken. And I was watching a, a showing on TV of the Passion of the Christ. So, and you know, it has, it has captions, of course. So I'm watching the scene where Jesus is already on the cross and where he says to one of, uh, of the men beside him, uh, truly, you will, today you will be with me in paradise. But in the movie, before Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise, he says, amen, today you will be with me in paradise. And I sat up, I was in my recliner just watching, and I sat up, I said, he said it the way that I had read, you know, and, and, and throughout the scripture, I read that, amen, and then he would speak. But a lot of times it's translated, truly I say unto you, or verily, verily I say unto you. So I looked up that verse right away, and sure enough, he said, uh, what, what he said to that man on the cross was, uh, truly I say unto you, or verily, verily. But the passion of the Christ got it right. It's the word, amen. And Jesus would say, amen. And then he would just give this great truth. And that whole series was about words uh, or, or phrases or teachings, verses that followed Jesus, amen. Things we can, we can trust in, things we can know for sure was the title of that series. Uh, for us, though, uh, Jesus is the only one who does that. For us, we say amen after a phrase, after a prayer. It's, it, for a lot of people, it's just kind of tradition. When they're done praying, they say amen. But amen, as I was just saying, is not just some random, uh, ancient, traditional word that you say at the end of a prayer, which means this prayer is over. For some people, it means, okay, let's eat. Amen. It's time to eat. Now, the word amen is a powerful word. I mean, this is a word that, that is a universal word. It's pronounced pretty much the same all over the world. It's like the word hallelujah. It's pronounced the same in every language. And all over the world in response to God's goodness, believers around the world say amen or amen. And one day in heaven, all around the throne, all of God's people from every race, from every tribe, from every group, will together shout in victory that word, Amen. In the New Testament, as I said, it, it was translated as uh, truly I say unto you, or verily, verily I say unto you. And it's come to mean uh, sure or truly an expression of absolute trust, absolute confidence. When you believe God, when you believe God's promises, you indicate your belief by saying, Amen. When God makes a promise, a believer's response should be, Amen. That's what we read in, first, in 2 Corinthians 1.20. When we pray according to God's word and according to God's will, we know that God will answer. So we end that prayer with a strong, Amen. You know, did you know that that word is also used as a title for Christ himself? In Revelation 3, look at Revelation 3.14. We read this. To the angel of the church in Laodicea, write, These are the words of the Amen. That's Jesus. The words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. Because Jesus is faithful and true. 
So he carries that title. Amen. We can be certain that God's word is always faithful. God's word is always true. When Paul said every promise of God in Christ is yea and amen. That's as strong as uh, an affirmation of truth as you can find in the Greek language. So I love this uh, definition of amen that I came across that I want to share with you. Amen means what has been said is faithful. What has been said is true. Now, watch it happen. Watch it take place. That's what amen means. I'm going to read it again. What has been said is faithful. What has been said is true. Now, watch it happen. Watch it take place. And I can't wait. And I can't wait. That definition, folks, will change the way you pray. You don't just end with, amen. But you end with an emphatic, amen. 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 Can you imagine if you finished your prayer that way at a restaurant? (laughs) You prayed, if you gave thanks for your food at a restaurant and you finished with a loud, amen. I mean, that would get everybody's attention. But you know what? When somebody shouts, Amen in church, in a church service. It's perfectly appropriate. Because in modern day language, what they're saying is truth. That's true. God keeps his word. God is a promise keeper. You know, people shout everywhere at football games, political rallies and arguments. They shout back and forth when they win something great. They hoop and holler. But for some reason, we're hesitant in church. And I understand the whole reverence thing. I get that. But I say, let God's people shout, Amen. Amen. It's true. Let people say, I believe it. Let it happen. And I can't wait to see what God is going to do. Now, here's an important point. God's promises speak truth over your life and over your situation. God's promises speak truth over your life and your situation. God knows what you need. And his promises address those very needs. Not in some desperate sense. Not as a last resort. Not like a Hail Mary pass in football. I'm not talking about Hail Mary, you know, the, the, um, the greeting Uh, found in Luke, or Hail Mary, the prayer. I'm talking about, you know, many of you that know football know that a Hail Mary in football is is this long pass, usually at the end of the game or or at the end of the first half. And and it's a desperation pass, right? And it's got only a small chance of being successful. We call it a Hail Mary. When when I was in college, I think it was my senior year, uh, I... I got an invitation from some guys that lived in our dorm, and they must have been pretty desperate. I didn't know them, except, I mean, I saw them daily there in the hallways. And it was a small dorm. All the guys lived in the first floor. The girls lived in the second floor. So there were no rules in that school. Um, But so they they invited me, these guys, uh, and I could could tell they weren't Christians. But uh, they invited me to play football. They must have been pretty desperate. They didn't know me. They, they might have known I was a music student. Well, you know, what music student plays football? So, But they invited me. I was young, and I, I had a lot of speed back then. And so I played wide receiver, and I, and I caught a few passes. So then after that, I was like, hey, let's go play some ball. Then I got to be uh, their friend. So one time we went out to play, and my wife, well, she, she wasn't my wife then, uh, but Lillian, we were already dating. And, uh, and my roommate... Uh, Lillian and my roommate David were in her car and they're parked by the field and they're watching us play, right? So I went out for a long pass. They threw a long pass. Uh, I, I didn't get to it. I dropped. I didn't drop it. I didn't. Maybe I did drop it. I, don't know. I didn't catch it. <laughs> I didn't catch it. And uh, so my roommate was there and he wasn't uh, sports minded at all. He was also a music student. He wasn't sports minded at all. So he saw that long pass and he told my wife, um, I think, I think that's what you call a Hail Mary. And my wife, who I hate to admit is funnier and wittier, wittier than I am, when he said, I think that's what you call a Hail Mary, and she says, well, no wonder he didn't catch it. He's not Catholic. <laughs> so 
That's not the Hail Mary I'm talking about when I say that God meets our needs, not in a desperate sense like a Hail Mary pass. No, He's, He addresses our needs. His promises are designed to fulfill His purpose and His plan in our lives. There are no desperation attempts by God. Only kept promises to meet our needs. So when your response to God's promise is amen, then it reflects this change in mentality. It's, it's a switch from, I really hope that God will do this, to truth, I believe God, I believe that He will do this. He will keep His word. Another, another thing I want you to know, is, and we've already addressed this, but I want to state it, that God's promises are not if or maybe. God's promises are amen. And we need more of that in our lives. We need to trust God because we live in a world that we don't trust. And we've developed mistrust and distrust. So what I want to do tonight or today as we conclude. I want to read some of God's promises in the Bible. Some of these promises we're going to cover in our series. Some we're not. But these are some of what I didn't look this up myself. Uh, but I, I did uh, read that there are uh, over 5,000 promises in the Bible. I'm, I'm not going to read all 5,000 this morning. I'm going to read just a few. But here's what I want to do. Here's the way I want to end this sermon today. After I read a promise, I want you to respond by saying or by shouting, Amen! Can you do that? We're going to make this interactive. We're going to make this interactive. Remember, amen means what has been said is faithful. What has been said is true. Now watch it happen. Watch it take place. Are you ready? Are you sure you're ready? All right. Here we go. That's a good answer. Amen. Yes. All right. Here we go. Exodus 14, 14. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Okay, could be better, but you got some other chances coming up. Okay, here we go. Deuteronomy, I love this, this one. Uh, Deuteronomy 31.8, I share it often with people. The Lord goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Amen. Second Chronicles 7.14, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Amen. Psalm 34, 17. The righteous cry out and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. Amen. Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Matthew eleven twenty eight. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Amen. 2 Corinthians five seventeen. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone; the new has come. Amen. Galatians six nine. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Philippians 4.19, And my God will meet all your needs according to His glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Amen. Two more. The prayer offered in faith. This is James 5.15. The prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. Amen. Then the last one from the last book of the Bible. Behold, I am coming soon. Let's stand together today and let's give God thanks. Give Him praise. Come on. Come on, give Him praise today. Father, we thank You that Your promises are yea and amen. Lord, I thank You that You are trustworthy. We have gotten accustomed not to trusting people. We have gotten accustomed not to trust our, our government. We've gotten accustomed not to trust our, our job, our employers. We live, dear God, with a cynicism. We live with bitterness. But help us, God, to turn that around and to start by understanding that you are a promise keeper and every promise in the book is mine. 
We can stand on the promises, dear Father. And today we worship you. Today we glorify your name. Come on and give him praise one more time. Can you do that, church?